Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. episode 29 of the Women in Vinyl podcast. You just heard Middle Night off the album If It Was, It Would Be So by Portland, Oregon's Dark Numbers. Thank you to them and Nadine Records for the use of the song. Nadine Records is a primarily vinyl-based record label that showcases a variety of unique artists and bands from the Pacific Northwest. Today's guest is Jeffrey Smith, the Communications and Partnerships Manager at Discogs, where he's been since 2017. Before that, he spent 13 years as the founder and principal publicist of Crash Avenue, a boutique music public relations firm. So Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So for people that don't know you, how did you get started at Discogs? Um, I had a small indie PR firm and Discogs had approached me around their 15th anniversary to do some PR around that anniversary and then just kind of kept continuing to come back and hire us out to do other work. And it turned into me getting approached by the then COO saying, Hey, what would it look like to come work for us? And you know, the rest is history. So. And you were a record collector originally, right? Before you started at Discogs? Yeah, yeah. So that that indie firm, you know, we were primarily doing independent music. We it also worked for the majors on a variety of campaigns as well. And, you know, records have always kind of been a part of my life because of that. Um, You know, I, I feel like it's a recent thing around records where it's but, you know, really, it's been probably the better part of the last 15 years. Yeah. I've been, you know, <laughs> collecting records at this point. Um, being a, um, you know, a, a 80s child, it was more, I started out in cassettes and then made my way to CDs. So I, I was right at the end of the first vinyl phase, right? Um, yeah. So I didn't really get into records or, you know, it was just too young, I guess, at that point, um, but found my way back to them. Yeah, that's the important part. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a bit about how, like the genesis of um, Discogs and how it kind of started? And- yeah, for sure. Yeah, so our founder, Kevin Lewandowski, um, was employed at Dell. And I, I ba, believe, ba, ba, ba. <laughs> <laughs> I believe um, you know, had the premonition that, you know, Discogs could exist. And, and really, you know, um, wanted to create a database for you know he and his dj friends to kind of collaborate on the records that they had in their collections you know share that data with one another and it just kind of it 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 evolved from that and you know i think if you were to ask him um he would have never imagined that it would have grown to be what it is today right? Yeah. Because it, it, it was born out of the spirit of sharing that data with his friends and, you know, everyone kind of having a sense of what each other had. And, and, you know, I think just that he and that community just blew it up. Yeah. I appreciate someone that is sharing a catalog with friends. <laughs> Organization I, I, after like, my I, own I heart. I envision like an old school catalog system where it's like, all right, Dewey Decimal, let's go. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I like a little a, a little library moment. But we yeah, yeah, and, and and knowing him, you know, he's way into the data and 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 preserving that data, and it's you know, it's yeah. a mission of of his for the company is to, you know, have the world's largest database of of physical or recorded music, and um, you know, gosh, we just crossed that fifteen million releases in the database um, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, you guys just, don't have any competitors, right? Um, not in that, not in that sense, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's other uh, chunks of music data out there, but as far as like physical catalogs, no. Yeah. And and within our users' collections, we're getting really close to there being 600 million items in our <laughs> users' collections. Well, <laughs> that's just, you know, that number is starting to feel like unreal. Yeah. You know, especially <laughs> when you look at your own collection, it's like. Oh, I've got 1500 records and how small of a part of that 600 million it is. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Wow. I had no idea it was that big. That's wild. Yeah. And, and you know, what's funny, it's like not a lot of people think of us as being that large of a site. You know, we're, we're a top 500 website in the world, not just music websites. Like, all websites, right? Wow. Um, the amount of traffic that's coming in, um, you know, the transactions that occur in the marketplace, just that overall volume. There's been a lot of talk over the last, you know, few weeks about uh, the vinyl industry in the United States approaching that $1 billion number. Um, there's enough information if you put all the pieces together to say that the global industry is probably in that four billion dollar range collectively and what's not being factored in there is you know all the stuff that happens on the secondhand market if you compared or if you added in the numbers uh from discogs and you know the other e-com platforms that 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 um support secondhand music i would dare say that number starts to you know double yeah well, even in, in like my kind of scope, because I'm a lathe cutter, right? So my mm -hmm. records don't generally see a commercial kind of section. They're not going into a store generally. So it's like a, mm -hmm. it's almost like a peer to peer kind of thing. And they don't have UPCs very often. Mm -hmm. um, they, we are on Discogs though. Yeah. So <laughs> That's I awesome. mean, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, and it really like makes independent musicians that are self-funded that don't have labels feel legitimate too because they're participating in the marketplace and they have a super limited option where they're like there was only 15 of these made look mm -hmm. out so yeah it's like a wikipedia like check mark for a musician yeah. i would say totally it, it gives you like a global presence a global legitimacy because yeah. people from anywhere can be like oh yeah i got that record but the yeah, and that's those are the types of records that really drive discogs. You know, it's um, it was funny. I was just checking the trending releases, and and the number one trending record on the site today is a Zeppelin tribute record. It was like incredibly <laughs> limited in its release, but because you know, I tell people sometimes that's kind of the drug we deal is rarity, totally. right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that that kind of drives everyone because of that frenzy to get that limited release, it immediately kind of shoves this artist up to, um, you know, the top of the trending releases, at least for today, otherwise may not have been known outside of, you know, those collectors that just kind of keep their eye on those sorts of things. Yeah. What was the decision or was it a decision um, to keep it community, like community ads and community focused because I know that, you know, I'm one of those people, as much as I love to archive and catalog when it's not on Discogs, I'm like, maybe I'll wait for someone else <laughs> to, <laughs> to add it. Right. Um, right. But, you know, with that comes sometimes misinformation and you and from the addition perspective, but then mm -hmm. also the price perspective can vary quite a bit. Was mm -hmm. that a conscious decision to keep Discogs community driven? I, I think that's at the heart of Kevin's vision for the company um, is, you know, the user generated content, um, the passion of those contributors within the community, um, 
you know, and, you know, one of the guidelines of that community is having a physical copy of that um, record or that cassette or CD in front of you in your hand to contribute that data. Um, that's almost as if it's verification that you're, you know, a fan or, or um, you know, so, uh, something of that nature that, that, that means you're invested in it, right? Um, you know, I don't see us shying away from that ever because again, that's just kind of the fabric of, of who it is that we are. Um, you've got real people generating real data that, that truly means something to them because if you've tried to contribute data to Discogs, um, it can be challenging <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know, and, and you, you've got to have a passion for music to, to, um, you know, to be a contributor in that space. And there are some human beings that spend hours upon hours upon hours, I'd say into days, um, contributing data, um, over and over and over. Um, to the site and and those people are very special people and um, you know it's amazing to see the work that they've done I mean like I said you know there's 15 million there's 15 million releases in the database there's 8 million labels like at, what it's crazy yeah it would be hard to have someone to manage that do you get people that write and complain about things that are like inaccurate or that they don't like about it? Um, I, I do know that we do, and I wanna, I wanna address that. I think it might be 5 million labels, but anyway, it's, there's, a, there's, a ton, there's a ton. Lots. Um, <laughs> it's like there's so, there's so many millions of things, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, I think from time to time, uh, my personal experience is I'll get messages from uh, individuals at record labels asking, about information on an artist that they're, you know, a project manager on. It's like, can we change this? Or, you know, can we correct an image or replace an image? And I was like, for sure, just create an account and, you know, follow the process. And you too can be a contributor on Discogs and change an artist's image. Um, but that doesn't guarantee that someone else isn't going to come in and decide that that's not the right image and change it to whatever, you know. Um, the community um, polices itself. Um, uh, they're incredibly efficient at that. So, um, you know, you can make an incorrect um, data submission, especially on someone if like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or something like that. And it will be minutes and, you know, it's changed back or, or corrected or something like that. Like me with Black Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a Black Sabbath experience? Well, I, you know, I, from Mistress of Reality, I troll Discogs a lot for why pressings were made and when and where and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I oftentimes will contribute to those or add or edit to, to them yeah. where I can. So, <laughs> well, that, that's another amazing aspect of the database. It's like all that information that's in there, you know, as, you know, I'm sitting here talking to a lathe cutter. The fact that you can go in and see, you know, there's information around lathes and who cut them, where they were cut. Um, um, I have a, I have, I have a, um, I have a question for you. Maybe this is, well, I'll just ask it. So yeah. um, I would like to have the both of you guess oh. who is the number one artist collected on Discogs. I think I will give you one hit. It is not a performer. I listened to the other podcast. It's not it's the same, I wonder. But I don't know. <laughs> At that point, you were talking about Pink Floyd being a, a trending yeah. Yeah. I think album. Just trending, yeah. I, th I think this is like, a, yeah, it's got to be But like number one collected. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 like it's a, a trick question. It's a record that everybody has. No, num artist, not a record. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, because I'm jumping in because I don't want a lot of dead air time. Yeah, yeah. No, Ray's really good at I'm making like, us look way smarter. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm like, so, I don't know. We press a lot of rumors. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah so but it's, art, it's, artist it's like... Bob Ludwig. Uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. All right. So he is, because he's, he's what, mastered everything? Um, 
because he's a, he's credited on all the things that he has mastered as well, right? Oh, it's like yeah. he he is he has touched more records, so he is he is undoubtedly more in your collection than any individual artist, right? Interesting. Throw it up for the mastering engineers out there, everybody. Well, Ludwig is a genius. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Because my cataloging <laughs> brain goes very like. I don't know. It, so like for me, like that wouldn't count. <laughs> yeah, cattle, that, that's, you know? <laughs> yeah, but that is the challenge of, of like, you know, our, the efficiency of the database where it's like, look, there's a release, there's a master release, there's an artist and there's a label. That's the four lines of delineation in the data. Yeah. So you wouldn't consider Bob and well, he is an artist, right? True. Yeah. In, yeah. In, in the truest sense, <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. Um, but what the average person would think as the artist, they think, well, it's got to be the Beatles or Pink Floyd exactly. or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why you have that massive number in the database is because, you know, everyone, everyone is an artist in our ecosystem. Right. So, um, but yeah, Bob's up there and I do believe, um, you know, maybe there's another two or three other, but kind of behind the scenes individuals. Bob just kind of sticks out in my head. Um, yeah, that's a cool fact. Before, though. before like, um, before like I think Lennon McCartney or something like that is like the first. Yeah. 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 How did the grading system come to be? Who set that, and how was it contributed to? Was that a community thing as well? Um. You know, I don't know the exact um, point of it being and why it's being. I mean, grading is a pretty much a standard situation within, you know, the vinyl world or, or just physical music. Um, it is community driven in the sense that, um, you know, the records that you have and especially in order to sell them. So I, I, and if I put those pieces together, it's got to be in that round, that 2004, 2005 ranges when that had to come to be because of the selling side of the marketplace side of Discogs. Um, but in order to assess value to the record, you've got to be able to grade it. Yeah. You know, and grading is such a hot topic. It's like, you know, there's some people that think, um, you know, the moment you crack the seal of the cellophane around the record, it is no longer mint. Right. So um, I'm actually one of those. I feel like if, if you've opened it, it's no longer, it's near mint. At near mint, mint minus, yep. Yeah, you know, so, and I don't know if mint minus is the thing, but. It's on um, there. You know, it's, it's funny, true. we got an interesting conversation where, um, uh, I forget who it was that brought it up, but it's like, we should be able to add additional pluses and minuses. And I'm like, I don't know if I can live in a world <laughs> where VG plus 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 exists. It's like, does that extra plus get you another like 75 cents on All the right. price tag? Is that why you want it in place? Um, I, would, I wish there was just like an option to just like filter out everybody that has like steel. Cause I'm just like, no, just get them out of my face. I don't care. <laughs> I like keep your sealed records to yourselves. Uh, I don't I, I'm, see them. I, I, I'd upvote that where it's like, I feel like if you could search for basically what a new, it's a new record at that point. So uh -huh. even if it's an yeah. old pressing and it's sealed, I'd consider that new. Yeah. I mean, the reason I ask is because I think a lot of people from record store owners to just individuals really like that is the Bible for yeah. how to grade a record. And so I think yeah. it's really interesting. I mean, I know that, you know, because Discogs took down the ability to buy and sell um, unofficials, which I think was yep. a good move, but it's also frustrating for me. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, the great that doesn't mean that you can't I don't support. Put the, yeah, you can you still can't put, it put up them there. in the database. No, no, that's true. Yeah, you can. And I do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I do. Um, no, and I think it's a great move because of modern day bootlegging, hundred yeah. um, percent. Yeah. The stuff I'm looking for just for listeners is not new. <laughs> it's no. very old. But um, 60s, 70s era. Yeah. Bootlegs. But yeah, I think everybody uses it for buying and selling. And I think that that is a really great tool um, for that. And a lot of times if I shop on eBay for yeah. something because they can buy and sell their things there, I'll screenshot Discogs all the time. And I'll be like, well, it looks like you're selling this as, 
you know, VG plus and this sold, you know, the trajectory of it at this time was this much. So you're way overpriced. Right. I mean, I would be paying $400 a Black Sabbath record if I didn't use Discogs to haggle all those prices. I mean, you're yeah. saving me a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's we and we have and have been for quite a quite a while that authority in that space just because mm -hmm. of the sheer volume of transactions and you know, again, back to the amount of uh, contributors and 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 that data there, it's like there's there's really nowhere else that you can find this information unless you carry around an old copy of Goldmine or something like that. But you know, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, it's I mean, and it, it's it's you know, that's a great spot for us to be in. Um, and, and, and folks looking at us in that way, it's just, you know, another authoritative uh, point that we have. Uh, and, and a reason for you to transact within Discogs ecosystem and not eBay. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Ugh, eBay is the worst. <laughs> well, you know, it really, really I, can I, be. But it, look, I, I, I will say this about eBay in the sense that it's like, they are serving a specific audience, right? And for sure, because, you know, if you want a new copy of the Adele record, um, it makes no difference if you're buying it there or from a seller in Discogs. I mean, obviously we want you to buy from our sellers so that they are making a living, um, but you're going to get what you get, right? Um, you're going to get that record. But if you want a certain pressing of that record or, um, you know, a certain variant of whatever the thing is, yeah. you can't, you, you, you will not know what it is that you're getting and you don't have that data there. And that's what makes us unique in the space as a whole is that, you know, go to the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper's page and look at the 1200 different variants of that release and you can buy every one of them mm -hmm. if you want and they're all different um i was just sharing i've got um the police's first record and i think i've got every vinyl variant of that one because it came out in every country had a different version uh -huh. of the cover and one was red and one was white and yellow and blue and all this stuff and I pulled it out for someone to take a picture of them because um, they were huge police fans. And, but if you were to do that on another platform, eBay or otherwise, um, you, you may not know what you're going to get. Yep. And then also you may not know how it's going to get shipped to you because <laughs> if you buy a record on Amazon, <laughs> it might end up being in a bag. Right. Which or someone insane. just slaps the label on it. I saw that too. Oh, I saw that. That was <laughs> hilarious. But the fact that there's some human putting a record in a bag in a right. to be shipped is like, you know, and it's there, there someone needs to start an Instagram just with just poorly Poor, shipped. Poorly shipped records. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, and like, you know. I'll, I'll say like, just that's specifically like, I don't buy a lot of new records. Mm -hmm. um and i utilize discogs maybe more than a lot of other people mm -hmm. because i collect really weird 45s and so that's like my crack yeah because i'm like okay i need the 1967 version of nancy sinatra something stupid okay i need this one and then i need it from germany and then i need it from this and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i have a whole like my want list is the weirdest thing that you'll ever see in your life. See, now you are in, you are the bullseye of our, oh, yeah. you know, of our target demographic, which totally. is like, you know, you, you, you literally have one place to go to, yeah. to find all of that, which is oh, fantastic. Yeah. It's like, look, if you're, you know, I know people that are fans of like Italian horror film soundtracks, sure. right? You really can't go anywhere else to to kind of satiate that that thing in you that draws you to that music unless it's here at you know mm -hmm. with with discogs and 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 to really extend that what i really think would like to get across is like it's not really discogs it's that there is a record store out there or a seller out there a in some place. There's another person from your tribe that is that out there. Is exactly. <laughs> yeah. That person on the other end, it, we're just a facilitator of that relationship. It's like, it's like we're like Tinder 
for for <laughs> for, for record nerds, right? It's like, wait, but you have <laughs> you have all the records that that I want, and yeah. you know, take all my money and yes. send them to me. And it always ends in a good first date. <laughs> There's no expectation. It's just transactional. You you set up the expectation that this is what I want. Okay, yeah. here. Great. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, our entire marketing team would just cringe at me calling Discogs tender <laughs> tender, but it I, you know, it's connective tissue there, right? So that's that's the thing. It's like all we're really doing is facilitating all of those different relationships. And you are finding your tribe. I'm finding mine. Jen's yeah. finding hers. Like you know, it's like it, it. That's that's the beauty of it. It's it's just this again, this little world where everybody's kind of found their tribes and who it is that they, um, you know, get along with and respect and appreciate and all those different things. Um, yeah, it's great. Hold that thought. It's time for an Amanda fact. At the end of the First World War, record companies faced their first real competition to the sale of the 78. You might have heard of something that used to be wildly popular. It was called radio. Today, it's still around, it's just not as popular. <laughs> the sound quality was better on radio than it was on early records, if your signal was good, that is. Another bonus of the medium was that if you owned a radio, new material was free every time you turned it on. Not the case with records. Interestingly, however, transcription discs, which were 16 inch diameter records that played at 33 and a third RPM, would go on to become an integral part of radio programming. Some might even say that the transcription disc saved the record manufacturing industry from obscurity till after the Second World War. These discs were able to hold about 15 minutes worth of sound on each side. And yes, if you are paying attention, that is a much larger disc with less playback time per side than what we are now accustomed to. Today's 12 inch 33 record holds about 20 minutes aside, give or take. Interestingly, it was their high quality sound and the flexibility that they offered for radio stations to play programs produced in other cities, solidified their value. Are you a producer, engineer, or broadcaster? Do you want to be? Either way, Nugent Audio is for you. Nugent creates innovative, intuitive, professional audio tools for high-end music producers, post-production engineers, and broadcasters. Their products make it easier to deliver better quality, save time, and reduce cost. As a Women in Vinyl podcast listener, you get 20% off your next Nugent Audio purchase using code WOMENINVINYL. Go to nugentaudio.com slash womeninvinyl. And now, back to the episode. Have you seen any changes in the last couple of years with the pandemic and how and how sales and just data looked on Discogs? Yeah. Um, the, you know, the personal story of this is pandemic hits and, and, and I, I hate that I, I would say this, but it's like, I called it like a couple of weeks beforehand. I was like, this is not gonna be good. And everybody was like, no, it's gonna last a couple of weeks. And I was like, I don't know. Um, but then when everybody kind of locked down, you know, the, the week that that happened, I was personally like, oh no, is this like, this, is this it? You know, mm -hmm. will we be able, and, and I think everybody thought that across the board in every industry. But then the next week, it was like, holy, you know, expletive. It was amazing. It's just like, I think everyone that had that connection to music just turned around and looked at their records and went, I gotta, I gotta put all this I gotta add my collection, or I gotta I start adding them on that list, <laughs> or I gotta, or I'm gonna go down my 45 fetish list and start binding all those records and buying them, and and that happened for the better part of you know a year and a half. You know, it's like where it was just this massive spike, 
you know, and e-com as a whole saw that spike as well. But what we've been able to do, and and we by you know that collective community of of everyone that that interacts on Discogs is sustain that. Where, you know, I think there were a lot of people that that just reconnected, and and kept going right mm -hmm. and and so now it's like um you know to transition into you know I, I we've always heard people talking about like the revival or the renaissance like it's not going anywhere we're so far past that right um so the the you know the i don't know main media voices out there or the larger demographics may think it's it's a it's a it's a new thing still but it's been again almost two decades yeah. you know and, year ex exponential growth right yeah yeah so it's no longer you know it's no longer a revival at that point especially when you know back to those revenue numbers when it's like you know a good four billion dollar industry it's like that's not an industry that's reviving itself. So, you know, and then you had, you know, Jack White, what was it two or three days ago, basically, you know, said, hey, major labels, it's time for you to build your own pressing plants. We um, were just talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely love the execution of that from just the entire, the entire 60 second video is kind of special. Um, I love um, how demanding he was of it as a <laughs> right. pressing plant owner, but it will never happen. Yeah. I love how it was like, again, at the end. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's not, I mean, the, the, now I, I'm happy to be wrong and I am more wrong than right, but it's like, I can't imagine universal going, let's take all of this money that we're making and let's drop a couple million dollars into building a pressing plant and then you know with all the resources it takes to people yeah people um adding it into the supply chain all of those kind of things it's like it's just not good because there's so many great plants you know i personally used to kind of like there was that boom that happened like five years ago where it felt like there's a pressing plant opening every five seconds, mm -hmm. right? And thought, wow, there's going to be some of these not make it. And now I'm yeah. like, well, we could have done with twice as many now, right? <laughs> right? It's like who, I, you know, it's, it's, it would like furnace, right? I, I, I like when furnace opened, I was like, just like, wow, like what an amazing facility, fingers crossed they make it, but it, it's just like. Yeah, now wow. we're booked for the year. Yeah. So and most yeah. And no and most most plants are just like we're not taking new orders until next year. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it's crazy. March. Yeah. 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 But I mean it's not it's not their fault. It's a supply and demand thing, right? There's only so many and yeah, you know, and 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 it's a skilled field of work, right? You you know, I can't go open a pressing plant. I can't all of a sudden be a lathe cutter. I all, you know, I can't do all of these things without years of knowledge and training around that thing. You know, I could, yeah. I could probably become a dentist quicker than I could, <laughs> I could you know, do, do one of those things and do it in the right way. Um, you know, it's like, I always, um, you guys familiar with Chad Kasem from Analog Productions mm, and, mm -hmm out in Salina, Kansas. It's yeah. like one of my favorite things in the world is to listen to that guy talk <laughs> about the 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 um mastery that it takes to create a record. Not only just the pressing of it, but just the process from the analog tapes to the finished product and and the story that that dude tells, you're just like, it's like this romanticized version mm -hmm. of this, you know, this thing that we all kind of, you know, we all have records and we all feel them and touch them and all that stuff. But it's like, somehow he makes it like, it's the, you know, it's a special, beautiful <laughs> thing that only a handful of people can achieve by making yeah. the perfect record. And then he yeah. sells you a $200 version of a record that you already have. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
love this guy. <laughs> He's the best sales guy ever. <laughs> oh. Do you, so obviously like you work at mm -hmm. Discogs, you have a prolific collection yourself. Have you, are you fully actualized in Discogs? Are you up to date? Do you, are you, do you have a stack that you need to input or are you like, I buy it, I put it in. I buy oh it. no, you know what? I'm, I just thought about this. It's funny you asked that. I thought about this this, this morning because um, I opened the app up because uh, I always check the app for my messages around my account there. And um, realize I'm behind on adding quite a few records, um, but I'm also just like behind. <laughs> <laughs> that speaks to me Feel on that. another level. Yeah. <laughs> that speaks to me on another level. Yeah, yeah. It's just like I've got a pile. I've got two piles of records. Um, <laughs> one is to put in collection. One is I've started a pile. I've started pulling from my collection to sell. Because oh, that's um, hard. That's hard. I, I'm starting to feel that sense of like, do I have records that, that I, I feel like I just need records that mean something to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that I have some that I've gotten over the years that it's just like, if I haven't played it in a couple of years, because really when you get a lot, it's hard to play them all the time. Yeah. But um you know, when you get to that point where like maybe something doesn't mean something, I feel like it might mean something to someone else and they might oh, need that's it. Nice. That's you know, a, I mean, that's a beautiful sentiment. Like also, you could that. always use that money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to buy records that might mean something yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it is that sense where it's just like, it's it starts getting a lot. Like, I don't understand how people have five, six, 7,000 records in their house. Like, where do they go? Where do they go? <laughs> They go in every single room. Uh, you buy house. a house with a yeah. basement big enough to fit yeah. them all. <laughs> yeah, and then have well, a turntable that. in every single room. Because she also has that. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Every house we looked at, we were like, ah, there's not a space big enough for the records. <laughs> so, finally found one. I'm glad that you're both aligned, though, on like, that's that was the call on the house. It has to yeah. be big enough to put the <laughs> records in. My, yeah, we, my call on my house was it's 333 feet from my most favorite Mexican restaurant in the city. <laughs> I love that. You told me that. It has a good margarita, right? <laughs> yes, I have. I've told you that in the past. It's like the selling factor was, I was like, it's 333 feet from El Mundo. You take all my money. So, um, yeah. I love that. <laughs> the best yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, discox has a really prolific list of resources that you guys have accumulated and created mm -hmm. Do, is there one that is used by the can, like the population in the community more than another one is there like an article that's specifically looked at more so i would think it would be the grading one but um yeah the vinyl price guide that's on the site um over its existence has just gotten so much organic seo value mm -hmm. that it's it's just created its own audience and you know it, it by far is is the most visited piece of like um you know we'll say content and quotes mm -hmm. yeah um you know on the site um but really and in the whole of Discogs, it's like, you've got to think of it as, you know, every release and artist is an entry point. And that's, you know, we have a huge amount of organic traffic just because of people looking for, you know, specific things at specific times. Um, you know, like the, you know, the 45s or, or like the Italian horror soundtracks or whatever those things are. It's like, there's always someone at some second in the world going, you know, I need to know about this. And, <laughs> and because of us being around for 20 plus years, um, and again, all of that SEO value and the way Google works and all of that magic on the internets, um, you know, it's just, we're just constantly, you know, there's not one thing that is, you know, the main attractor of audience into the site as a whole. But yeah, but that vinyl price guide is like pretty relevant to the to that question and and um you know anything around that um in trying to determine value is is right up there 
Well, you work in marketing and partnerships. Mm -hmm. So before we ask one of our last questions, is there anything mm -hmm. that you can share that you're excited about coming up uh, or that you're you're doing that you want to get word out about? Yeah, this is the hype portion of our show. The hype portion. Per yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, yeah, I do. It's, you know, um, speaking of content, it's always been difficult for our audience to find, you know, more of the editorial side of what it is that we do. Um, you know, we, we have had this thing called the Discogs blog that's had a lot of great information, a lot of great stories in it. Um, yeah. um, it's just a treasure trove of, of just content. And, and really the only way to get there is if you figured it out through the navigation bar or you know follow us on social media. So with that, um, we had a campaign at the end of last year called Discogs Digs, which was really about discovery. And we asked um, some notable record stores to give recommendations of records based on a certain record that we knew was like, you know, just like a known um, piece of art. And then got into gear and the different, you know, if you're a beginner, how to tackle like the turntable setup, or if you're kind of a, you know, a wannabe audiophile, what that looks like, <laughs> down to even kind of humanizing kind of playlist mentality where it was like mood based things. Like um, yet another piece of content that goes crazy for us is like the 35 saddest albums. Um, everyone's sad. <laughs> Everyone loves that thing. It, it's it's yes, like the, it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? So updating all of those moods and, and a thing that we learn from that and, and heavily promoting it is that there was this hunger in a lot of our audience to, to get these humanized recommendations. I, I think what we're going to see on the other side of the Spotify algorithms generating these playlists for you is that, yes, it's very good at what it does. But um, what else is special about music is, you know, again, I can walk into guest room records, which is like three or four blocks away from my house as well. Like, yeah, another reason why I picked this house. Shout very out to Lisa. Yeah. Shout it, out to Lisa, friend of the podcast. Well, Go so ahead. Lisa, I yeah. literally will walk in and say, Lisa, what am I buying today? Yes. <laughs> She's and the best. I'll go in for what I want, but I typically leave with a record Amazing. that Lisa has told me to buy. And I buy completely blind because she's known me. Travis and Lisa have both known me long enough to know what it is that I like. That's and awesome. then I listen to have them. impeccable taste too. So you can't really, they, they're not going to steer you wrong. Oh, I, those two are two yeah. especially magical human beings and I totally. love them and they're great people. Uh, and, and, you know, as a resource, they're just, you know, they're just, they're, they're incredibly deep. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love both of those people. Um, but again, I'll leave with, always leave with a record. Um, that I had not intended to buy and I will listen to it. And it's just like, no, I get it. I will never not do that. So with that at the heart of it, it's like back to that humanizing recommendations. You know, we're learning that, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people are coming to Discogs for that discovery side of things, right? And, and they've been taking the very long way through data and through release pages and and clicking YouTube videos within those release pages to kind of discover all of those things. So we're taking that <clears throat> digs campaign and really expanding it into like a platform and, and, and it will encompass that, right? That'll be the place where you can go for music discovery. It'll be something that's ongoing. It will not just be a singular campaign. It's just going to be that place. And so our hope is to integrate it more inside the platform, have it be um, more visible and so that more people can find it and, and, and kind of deepen their connection to music through that way. That's awesome. Who came up with the shake app where you shake your collection and a random record shows up? Oh my gosh. And people discover that in the most random of ways. That person right? needs um, a high five like so good. Yeah, I love you know, that. I, I and I told someone else, I think it was in another podcast, I think, where it was like my wife does that to pick out records at this point because there's just <laughs> yeah. too many. Yeah. Um, 
and they're all cramped. They're all crammed in so tight you can't even pull one out anymore, right? <laughs> I don't know who, to be honest with you, started that because the apps were launched at like my arrival. Um, I could find out for you, but if, yeah, I just want to give them a high five. Yeah, high yeah, five. Give them a high <laughs> five. And like a, a like a women in vinyl like seal of approval. <laughs> great job. Great job. That, I love that functionality on the on the app though. It's like um especially not only does my wife use it, but it's like if people are well, when people were coming over a lot more than they have in the last two years. Um the because my front door is also the office and where all the records live. Um first time at the house, everyone's like, holy crap, like look <laughs> at all the records. Like that was that I didn't even know that that was a thing. And they immediately want to like, you know, most people immediately was like, let's play one. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you realize like how massive we are within the world that we live in. But then the moment you step outside of it, everybody's like, what? what? It was <laughs> like what? records were this, yeah. you know, really like we're this huge online record store and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, sure, records? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so true no yeah. i'm big in japan no i promise yeah it's like that but i feel like it's that way like i feel like i feel like i wouldn't want to be a record store owner even though i'm sure all of them that do well do quite well for themselves but then if you say you're a record store owner they think of like high fidelity in the 90s when that came out and rob was always broke right. and, all, and it's like it feels like that right mm -hmm. i wonder uh, if i wonder if uh, yeah i guess they the the uh the redo of High Fidelity that was on Hulu mm -hmm. is amazing if you haven't caught that. I was, because I was getting ready to say, I wonder if you could make that movie again. I don't think you could remake that movie kind of word for word and, and action by action, but it's like, I think what they really did a great job. They was, did. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a much more realistic today version. For sure. Yeah. And she was a great choice too, I yeah. think. Yeah. I'm so sad that they didn't renew it. I yeah, so many characters on that. It was so good. Cause people that collect records are just way more interesting than the average person. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Look, this whole conversation is based on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean, it it feels true to me. It's like, um, you know, it's like if if you the more records that you have and the and the closer relationship you have with them, I feel like you just you have more to talk about. Absolutely. With that said, we have the seven inch question. Oh no. Oh yeah. <laughs> Especially being a prolific collector, this might be a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. um, if you had the opportunity to make a custom seven inch record of your own choosing of any band from any era and any song on the A side and the like on the B side, any band, any song, any band, any song, split seven, what would you make? It's kind of like a de the extension of the Desert Island thing, but you don't have to just take that. <laughs> you can just make your favorite record. I, I would want to have PJ Harvey's Rid of Me on side A. But I'd want like the uncompressed, like the dynamics on that song are the thing that absolutely kill you. Um, and then for the B side, I'd want, um, okay, so the yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd want them to do a cover of PJ Harvey's Long Snake Moon. Oh, nice. I feel like Karen O is the only singer that matches PJ's like to be get down and be so soft and sweet and quiet and then destroy you the next second. And I feel like that band could, you know, I don't know. It's like if they, if there was ever like a PJ tribute record, it's like, just let the yeah, yeah, yeah's do all the songs. Like don't even <laughs> mess with like getting anyone else. But it, I, you know, it, if I'm asked like in the spur of the moment, like I feel like those two things I'd want to hear. Like I, like I want to hear Karen O 
scream that like long snake moan line, but like have it feel like it means something completely different. You know? <laughs> I love that. So nice. Wow. The, this podcast is mint, sealed, signed, delivered. You can play it whenever you want and it's not going to age. So thanks so much for joining us, Jeffrey. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun today. Oh, yeah. that's great. Uh, we really appreciate you and your platform. Yeah. And hopefully some point, maybe women in vinyl can collaborate in some way. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, we would love that. Oh, very, we very absolutely much. love it, too. All right. Cool. We'll have we'll a good release evening. release you into the wild. Yes. The wilds of Kentucky. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. You, too. Bye. Thanks for joining us on the Women in Vinyl podcast. You can join our ever growing list of sponsors, other record labels, Selector, Koppel Design, Eargasm, Groove Washer, Glowtronics, New Gen Audio, and bow, 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 Vinyl Revolution Record Show. And thanks for sponsoring the show. Um, hey, as always, you can join our conversation on Instagram or send us a note at media at womeninvinyl.com. Clock us. Send us info. If you have a question, yo, we got the answer or we'll find it. We won't lie to you. And check out womeninvinyl.com for past episodes, the store, the job board, and the library of resources. Don't forget to like and subscribe and give us a review on your favorite podcast delivery method. You can also contribute to furthering our mission at patreon.com slash womeninvinyl. Hey, guess what? This episode, 45 minutes. You know there was more. You want more? You get more. Go to patreon.com and you can get more. And you'll find all the B-sides, the deep cuts, and the amazing extras, including longer episodes, and contribute to the creation of scholarships and educational opportunities to further the demystification, the infiltration of more women and non-binary identifying humans into the final making space. Decrease in those turnaround times every week. Yeah. We love your records. We want you to love them too. Womeninvinyl.com. This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl and Red Spade Records. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.